I just thinking, I bet you're thinking, he's a fraud, he's wearing shoes. <laughs> and, and probably I am a fraud, just like we all are. I think we all have that fear of being a fraud, don't we? Am I real? Because we're not, I think, really. I mean, as far as you're concerned, what I am is a set of uh, signals firing off from your neurons, creating a description of a man standing in front of you. Uh, actually, from my point of view, so it's the same thing. I mean, my experience of me is just a set of uh, signals firing off from my neurons. Um, however, in this game of life that we are playing, because it is theatre really, um, we construct reality through a filter of perception. And um, I don't rehearse these speeches, by the way. This is just coming right off the top of my head. Um, I, uh, the, the, uh, the barefoot doctor is a, is a metaphor for a humble healer. And they were mostly women, in fact, in ancient China, who were like medicine women. They were powerful, they had magic, they knew how to do acupuncture, how to dispense herbs. They teach qigong energy exercises. They do magic spells for people to become pregnant or to protect them from evil and all sorts of stuff. And uh, they were doing it from a, a, call, a sense of calling, uh, a motivation to be of service to their fellows, humanity. Uh, rather than from a sense of self-aggrandizement. It was about serving. Uh, they base their philosophy on, or their way on what's called Taoism, which is uh, an ancient Chinese um, uh, origin, origin, uh, originated system of life. It's not a religion. What it actually is is a, a cosmology which is very akin to modern quantum physics. It's the, the sense that there is a a prime cause, which they call Tao, uh, spelled T-A-O. And um, this word is not sacred. It's not something that you have to revere. You could insult it if you want. Nothing would happen to you. It wouldn't punish you. It's not a person. That It's not anthropomorphized. It's just the prime cause. And none of us has the mental capacity to explain or, uh, or define it. Um, th this prime cause exists forever. It's never born, it never dies, it just is. And we could say that it's comprised of uh, consciousness in motion, like primordial consciousness in motion. This phenomenon, uh, primordial consciousness in motion, is they call chi, or, or psychoactive energy. Um, when this, as this, this pre you call it a presence, I experience it as a presence behind all manifest phenomena. Um, when this presence decides to, so to speak, kind of morph into form, it, the universe is born. And um, once that happens, you have a polarity. You have the prime cause and you have the manifest universe. And whenever you have a polarity, they say, uh, arises yin and yang. Now, the yin is like the contractive tendency in all phenomena, and the yang is the expansive tendency. And these two dance around each other in a cyclic motion. So that you will, and it affects every stratum of, of existence, so that you'll have a phase during e each hour where you feel, well, oh, life is good, I'm feeling really great, I can do it. And then when, oh, maybe I'm mad, maybe I can't, maybe, you know, you, you, you're dipping and rising constantly through the, through the day, through your life. And, and events do that as well. Events get really difficult, and then they get easy, and then they get difficult, and then they, it's usually, when, well, it's always, when things reach their zenith, it's when they're gonna tip into the opposite. So, if you look at economic cycles, for example, the one that we've just come out of, uh, probably the biggest, at least most spectacular economic boom in at least recorded history um, over the last, how many decades, three, four decades. Uh, now, uh, it reached its zenith, and it is now we're, we've entered into probably what would be the biggest economic uh, slump uh, in recorded history, and all the ramifications of that. Um, it's cyclical. Uh, it, there are big cycles and little cycles, and all of this is operated by yin and yang. You have your soft side, you have your hard side, you have your generous side, you have your mean side, you have your altruistic caring side, you have your ruthless side. Neither is good or bad, they just are. You can't have one without the other. So you can't have all brightness because there has to be shade. And so 
if somebody is glowing with brightness and utterly beautiful to look at and looking absolutely perfect and manicured and presents themselves perfectly, you can be sure that behind that is the opposite as well. Um, and uh, so for every truth, there is the opposite. Uh, nothing is fixed, everything is relative once you're out in the world of manifestation. Anyway, so much for that. Where that cosmology gave rise to a, a, a philosophy, a set of principles. Um, basically, that you have a true nature. Uh, you have true nature, and the R is to come back into your true nature. If you do that, things will work out beautifully for you. You'll go through the ups and the downs, the yin and the yang cycle, but you won't be affected by it because you're not personally involved in it, so to speak. You're like the, uh, the background presence inside observing yourself going through the theatre of life. And um, if you can learn to come into your true nature, your life will be magical and powerful and beautiful. And they call this Wu Wei, which means the path of least resistance, the path of manifesting what you need just by intending it rather than contriving it or struggling or striving or pushing other people out of the way to get it. Um, they, uh, I, I mean, I could go on. This isn't the, 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 the arena to do that in. I've got to go into the great depths of the Taoist uh, philosophy because it is fascinating and I, I highly recommend a little bit of research into it. Um, but the, uh, from these principles, from these, this philosophy, um, came a set of psychophysical methods or techniques by which to embody the principles of the philosophy so that you actually move with it in, in your daily life, physically, so to speak, psychophysically. You, you actually embody the principles. So um, the yin and the yang, for example, I'm aware that if I've got my weight on the right side, my left side is empty. So I've got my yang full strong side and my left empty soft side, and I'm constantly aware of the switch. Um, I have my soft side in the front, my hard side in the back. I have the, the yang heat rising kind of uh, noisy bit of me at the top where my mouth is, but you know, mostly it's, that's the noisy bit. And, uh, <laughs> and then the lower part is, is the quiet uh, yin soft side. Um, well, anyway, these methods um, are uh, known most famously as Tai Chi. That's a very famous Taoist method. It's a slow-moving martial art. Well, it's not really slow-moving. You, you practice it solo, slow-moving, to appreciate the, the movement of energy within. It's actually a boxing form. When you use it, it's boxing, so it's not done slow-motion unless the other guy's going slow-motion too. In fact, even then, you'd probably want to go fast. Uh, <laughs> Um, acupuncture is, a, is a, a famous modality of Taoism. Uh, this doesn't mean that everybody that practices acupuncture knows about Taoism. Most of them don't, but it, it came from the Taoist system. Uh, feng Shui, the art of, of um, moving your furniture around and placing your buildings and so on and so forth, uh, that is a Taoist art. Um, I could go on and I could go on. Uh, it addresses itself to all kinds of areas of life. And um, this is what I've been, I'm 58 and three quarters. I've been doing this stuff since I, the, the Taoist thing since I was 19. Prior to that, at the age of 11, I, was, I started doing Aikido, which is the Japanese version of Tai Chi. Uh, I is Tai, Ki is Chi, and Do is Dao. So it's the same, it's just a more simplified version of, of the Tai Chi. And I was very fortunate to study with an elderly Japanese uh, master who had come to London as a healer, uh, had a practice in Harley Street. And um, I was obliged to learn how to heal people. And I'd always been uh, fascinated, riveted by the human condition, even as a tiny kid. I was so much more interested in what was going on inside and, and inside everybody and how we all interacted than I was by football or television or, or any of the distractions. The actual human condition is what I found riveting and still do and always have done. Um, not to the exclusion of enjoying the entertainment, of course, but just that at the nub of it all, surely it's the human condition. That's the most interesting aspect. Um, and I was fascinated by the disparity between the words that were being spoken by people and the actuality. In other words, the, the differential of, um, you know, the lies. 
and what was so, what I could see was so, and what was being said was so. Um, okay, I'm going to just jump a bit. Uh, I'm 14 years old. It was 1968, uh, swinging London. I, I grew up in London. Uh, and uh, a party uh, in, a, in, a, in a penthouse. Uh, everyone's taking LSD, and a guy is standing on the roof about to fly. So that somebody gets hold of me, he could come up on the roof, he's going to jump this guy. Because this, in those days, LSD, there was a fashion to fly if you were on LSD. Things go in fashions, they really do. These days, if people take LSD, I don't think anyone would think of flying off a, off a roof. Because we learn, you know, I suppose. <laughs> Well, I hope we do. And uh, it was really interesting. It, well, interesting. It was really quite horrible, actually. But he was standing, and it was night time. It was quite cloudy, uh, November night, the orange street light glowing in the sky, a bit windy. Like, whoosh, and he's standing there swaying on the edge of the roof. And um, the people are sort of a bit around, but no one's going too close. Somebody's trying to talk to him. He's not listening. He's completely off his trolley. And I go up about three feet behind him, and I do this thing that I've been taught where you, you magnetize someone with your hand. You, you connect with the energy, and you just pull them. If I don't if do it too strong, you'll all be on top of me, so I'll stop. But he did actually come back and uh, got off the, the ledge and came down. I kept pulling him towards me, benignly, not in a, in a weird way, just because it was the only thing to do. I was amazed that it worked. It was like, phew. Wow. I mean, I have to be honest, I was tripping as well. So it was very, very powerful. <laughs> and um, uh, he, he, he came um, towards me. And I knew from my kind of altered state, which had opened up my filters of perception, so I could see the energy really clearly. And I was going in my mind, going, wow, wow, it's really true. There is this energy. Shit. It's not just some sort of oriental myth. You know, I could actually really, really see it as light. I could see there was a big black hole around his kidneys. Uh, you could see that he was like deficit of energy, of life. And I just, I, I came up to him and I put my hands on his back. Now, in 1968, people didn't touch each other that much unless it was, you know, shaking hands, kissing, or it was a sexual thing. But guys, especially, would not put their hands on each other. They still don't that easily these days. But, so it was an odd thing to do, but in the altered state environment, it was totally cool. I put my hand on... <laughs> put my hands on his kidneys and it was like a furnace coming out of my palm. I'm, it's not, I'm not saying I'm clever to have done that. It wasn't that. I was really just purely a vessel because I wasn't even really there. And, and you could feel him heating up in the kidneys and as that was happening, he and me starts coming into this state of real clarity. I mean, absolute clarity and focus. And then we, we started talking. And uh, I actually realized that, it, aside from all the, the hysteria of flying off roofs on LSD and all that, because, you know, as a fashion, uh, there was, must be pain there, because otherwise, why is he jumping off a roof? It wasn't just because he thought he was an angel and he could fly. There's something underneath. There's pain there. And uh, we started talking, and he started telling me his story, and there was a lot of pain there. And then, big, you know, like, big surprise. I still get surprised, in fact. Everybody's got a lot of pain going on inside. That's what you learn. It's like... I did this conference for um, Boots, it was actually, their head office. I used to sell, I created this perfume, this kind of healing, sexy perfume smell, and I created a range out of it. It wasn't from a consumerist, materialistic kind of uh, thing. I just like having a laugh, really, and it was a laugh. It was a bit of conceptual art. If I could get messages out in a place like Boots, how funny would that be? And, um, and it was funny. And then they invited me to a conference, and I addressed 400 people who were sort of your age, uh, you know, young, happening, good-looking, uh, bright, vibrant people, all looking very smart and really cool and really successful. And I'm thinking, wow, what a successful-looking, you know, happening bunch of people. Really nice to see that. I give them the talk. It's a big rah-rah chat. Everyone's laughing. I get off the stage. And this spontaneous line forms at the side of the stage. And one by one, people start coming up and telling me their stories, asking for a bit of advice. And I was actually almost crying by the end of it, because some of these stories, you think, wow, I don't know how you walk around with that suffering going on, and yet there you are looking so brave. You know, slowly but surely, it's dawning on me that everyone's got a lot of pain going on inside. And uh, so my, my uh, motivation is to alleviate that pain wherever I can. But I think that first, before alleviation, has to come acknowledgement. Like, people have to feel okay about acknowledging that they have pain at all. 
in the 50s, when I was a kid, um, people were so removed from their inner worlds, they didn't even have one anymore. It was all front. It was all, hello, 958-7253. Everyone had their telephone voice. Everybody were acting. We, you know, they, they had no inner world. So people used to have nervous breakdowns. That was the fashion then. Um, Nobody really knew what they were. They were just called nervous breakdowns. You get rushed off to a hospital in an ambulance, come back a few weeks later looking a bit dizzy, and then life would carry on. The, the, um, th this urge to somehow alleviate human suffering and to get people to expose their pain, uh, it's almost like being rude. It's like saying, hey, you've got pain. You go, no, I haven't. You just say I've got pain. But what's happened is, as a result of partly my work and lots of other people over the last... 30 years or so, people feel more free about talking about what's going on with them. So they're not pretending they don't have pain. That's the first step. Um, it, my feeling is, is that if we could kind of discern these principles that I that I'm, uh, dedicate my life to studying, and we could somehow educate everybody to have these principles um, embodied within them, the levels of suffering and pain globally, uh, collectively, would reduce a little bit and as that happens then we have a chance to carry on this incredible magnificent experiment of, of humanity uh, if we don't and we allow the pain to stay buried and to drive us and to cause us to act out destructively and psychotically as is uh, quite often the case these days and increasingly so um geez i've only got one minute and four oh gosh i need three goes of this <laughs> anyway, look, I'm going to do it really quickly and lay it on you, because this is it. You, um, uh, you have your front, which is involved in the drama of everything. All the, the, the tension, the thoughts, the uh, 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 that's you, who you think you are. But who you really are, your true nature, is in the back. If you sit back inside now and you lean up against your shoulder blades, your hip bones, the front of your spine, and you are then in command of what's going on in the front, can you feel that? You let your mind go into the back of your head. We've got 31, 30 seconds left. Your mind going into the back of your head so that the front is really quiet. You're sitting in your back so you can feel the tension in your belly. You can breathe and let it go. And now you're in command. That's the trick. If you can do that, mental health will be yours forever. Bless you and thank you.